Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and the actions of our lives be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Holy Trinity Sunday is an unusual Sunday. It's also an unusual Sunday when the pastor is not really here. And I thought, well, why not go for the trifecta? It's Trinity Sunday after all, right? And do something even more unusual in the manner that I record the sermon that you're able to watch here today. So we're doing a little bit of unusual, but that's okay. Holy Trinity Sunday is an unusual Sunday because generally when we think about the Sundays in the church here, they're associated with the life of Jesus. We celebrate on Christmas, Jesus's birth. We celebrate or commemorate, I guess would be the better word, on Good Friday, Jesus's death. On Easter Sunday, we do celebrate his resurrection, that Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And just recently, we celebrated Jesus' ascension, his ascension to the right hand of the Heavenly Father. And upon his ascension, Jesus told his disciples, I'll come back in the same way that you see me go. But before I come back, there's work for you. And so wait here in the city, wait for the gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so just last week, Pentecost Sunday, the receiving of the Holy Spirit on those first disciples, now apostles, that will go forth and share the good news of Jesus, the Savior of the whole world, the King above all kings. That brought us, though, to this week, to Holy Trinity Sunday. And Holy Trinity Sunday isn't a Sunday in which we celebrate something in the life of Jesus. Rather, it's a celebration, if you will, of a doctrine in the church, that is a teaching that we have, that we believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but only one God. It's the only Sunday in the whole church here set aside, not for a person or an event, but for a teaching. And while this teaching is impossible for us to truly understand. People have tried in various ways to understand that truth that God is one God but three persons, and they've used different metaphors. Maybe you've heard of them. There's, uh, well, God is like water, and there are three phases of water, liquid or gas or solid, but that's not exactly what God is like. Or the God is like an egg. There are three parts of an egg. There's a shell, there's the egg white, and there's the yolk. But that's not really what God is like either. Or there's the apple, which is a lot like the egg. There's the skin, the meat, and the seed. But if you take any one of those examples and you really dig into them, they just don't work. In fact, no one has ever been able to explain the Holy Trinity. Instead, the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is something we believe. We can't explain it, but rather what we see is that in Scripture, this is how God reveals himself. He reveals himself as one God, but Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are a number of different places we can look into the Holy Trinity and see this clearly taught, but probably for me, one of the best ones is our baptism. Jesus gave his disciples baptism as a gift to share with the whole world. He said, if you want to make disciples, here's how. Baptize them in the name, not names, but in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That in baptism, God puts his name, his identity on us. But it's not split it's, it's one name, one identity. And so we receive in baptism the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, last Sunday too, we also had an opportunity in the event of Pentecost to see an example of the Trinity being played out. Again, it's not something we're asked to understand. We're instead shown that Jesus ascends to his heavenly Father and receives the gift of the Holy Spirit from his Father, and then he gives that gift to the church. He pours out the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
And so today, I want to look not at the doctrine of the Trinity as something for us to understand, but rather to see that in the Trinity, we have received a gift. This is why we believe what we believe, because in the doctrine of the Trinity, we have our God who shows himself and gives himself to us. And he does so for a great purpose. So I'm going to look at this through the image of pouring. After all, that's the exact wording that is given in Scripture about what happened on Pentecost, that in Pentecost, the Holy Spirit, which Jesus receives from the Heavenly Father, is poured out on the disciples. So this is what God wants us to understand. He wants us to understand a right relationship with Him. And we can do so through this image of pouring. So God is like this pitcher of water. And God is selfless. He pours himself out into us as he created us. He created us in his image to be like him so that we too would be like him in every way. And so as God is selfless and pours himself out in us, we are that same way. And we pour ourselves out. We're just like him. We share his love, his blessings. This is what we were meant to be like. And isn't it wonderful? Isn't it refreshing? But there's a problem in the story. And see, the problem is we, because of Adam and Eve, because of their sin, we're no longer the way that we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be these vessels meant to be poured into by God, our Heavenly Father, to receive His blessings and His gifts. But sin has changed us. Instead, we're not ready. We're not willing. See, Scripture says that because of sin, we are blind. We are dead. We are rebels against God. So when God's ready to pour out his gifts and his blessings onto us, sin makes it impossible. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> we can't receive what God has to give. Some people want to say, well, sin makes us less able to receive. It's, it's kind of like if that cup is a moving object and you can't quite see where it's supposed to be. But scripture says, no, it's worse than that. We cannot receive what God wants to give. We're dead. There's no hope for us. We can't even hope to receive just a little bit. It's impossible. Well, it's impossible for man anyway. Nothing is impossible for God. And so God does a miracle in all of us. He changes us. It is by God's own grace, his mercy at work in us, that he is able to turn us around. He is able to give us a right relationship with him. This is what the Holy Spirit does in us. Now, in Acts, you hear Peter call out to the people to repent. And literally, repent means to turn around. Now, some would say repentance is something that we are called on to do ourselves. But Scripture teaches that even repentance is impossible without the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, the Holy Spirit turns us around and we're able to receive what God gives. And He has done that in all of your lives. The Holy Spirit has turned you around. Do you know how? Do you know where? Scripture teaches that it happens in our baptism. It's in those waters when we are turned around and God pours into us His Holy Spirit. He creates faith in us. We are changed. But that happens each and every day, too. See, when you are baptized, that is a gift that you receive once and for all, but it is a gift that you hold on to your whole life. Martin Luther had a wonderful way of talking about baptism. He talked about it as a gift that we have each and every day of our lives. So he said, when you wake up in the morning, make the sign of the cross and say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And when you go to bed at night, do the same thing. What was Martin Luther advocating? He was advocating that we remember our baptism as that place when God turned us around, when he forgave our sins, he put us in a right relationship with him. What a wonderful gift. 
And we need to remember that each and every day because while God has changed us, the sinful flesh still clings to us. We daily sin much and we need his forgiveness. So each and every day we go back to baptism and we remember our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We remember what he has done. What he has done to us is he has changed us and he has filled us up. He has poured into us his grace, his love, his Holy Spirit. That makes all of the difference. But now what? Now that we're in this right relationship, that we are changed, turned around and filled, what do we do next? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, the story is not over simply because God flips us over and turns us right around and pours into us his Holy Spirit. He pours into us himself. That's not the end of the story because, as I said, that's not what God is like. God doesn't simply pour into us himself. He changes us to be like himself. And we pour for a purpose, don't we? When you get up and have breakfast, maybe you take that pitcher of coffee and you fill your cup. You pour into it so that you can receive that caffeine, so you can receive that morning pick-me-up or when you've driven your car around a little bit and you go to the gas station, you are pouring in that fuel so that your car can go again, so that you can go from part point A to point B. We pour for a purpose. And God pours for a purpose too. He wants us to be like him. Just as he pours himself out, God wants us to pour into others as well. And we do that, don't we? We pour into other people the love and grace and forgiveness that we receive. You may have people that are in your life and they're not always easy to live with. It's a challenge. It's draining. And it literally is. You pour your love into them. You have great patience with them, but it wears on you. And after a little bit of time, you find your patience is exhausted. You don't have anything more to give. You don't have any more love. You don't have any more kindness. And you get angry. You you say something bad. You, You walk away. You hurt somebody. That's not good. See, we pour out into others. We get excited. We want to share the good news of Jesus, but then something happens. The tank seems to run empty. We turn into different kind of people. And that happens in life too, because we forget that once we pour out into others, we do lose a little bit of something, don't we? We forget that once we are empty, we can go back to where we were filled, so that we can be filled again. Yes, God fills us up, and we need to remember that's not just a one-time thing. He does it again and again and again. That's one of the reasons why we stress the need for us to come to church. It's one of the reasons why we stress the importance for us to read our Bibles. It's not just, well, if I haven't read my Bible, I'm not a good Christian. Or if I don't go to church enough, well, they're, they're going to think that I don't need that, that I'm not one of them. And so I need to go to church just enough to make sure everybody knows that I'm there, I'm participating, I'm part of the crowd. But that's not it. We say that you need to read God's word. We say that you need to go to church because we know that you need that, because we know that we need that. Why? Because you end up feeling empty. You pour yourself out into the lives of the people around you and you have nothing more. It's empty. You need a refill. You need God to pour out his love, his grace, his forgiveness into you. And that's what happens when you come to church. You receive his gifts. You enter into those doors, and one of the first things we do is we begin that service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Why? To start to fill ourselves up again. 
to remind ourselves of why we're there, to remind ourselves of our God who has called us there, who fills us up with his gifts. And in that service, we receive his forgiveness. In that service, we hear his word. In that service, we receive Jesus's body and blood. What is all of that? if not God, filling us up again and again and again until we start to overflow. He doesn't want us to leave church half empty. He wants us to leave church completely full so that in that long week ahead, you can pour yourself out. You can pour out his gifts into the lives of the people around you. But wait, that's not all. There's more. You see, something special happens when we come together as the body of Christ. Sometimes people think, oh, if faith is just about believing in Jesus, I don't need anyone's help to do that. I can go to church to do that. In fact, pastor, you just said all I need to do is remember my baptism and I can do that on my own. I don't need all of your help to do it. And while there may be some logic behind that, Scripture does not agree with that sentiment. And you could look at that from a number of different perspectives and see why that just isn't helpful. You see, if we take what happens in church, we get a lot of us Christians and we put us together and God pours out his gifts into us. And that's a wonderful thing. And when you are with other people, when the gifts poured out into you, fill you, they fill the people around you so that pretty soon you're not just receiving the gifts of God for yourself, you're receiving them for other people too. Because as they are poured out into you, they spill out in the people around you. And so we are built up together. Built together is stronger. But there's also a picture of what happens when we go out in the world See, we go out into the world not merely as individuals, but we go out as the body of Christ. And when more of us are put together, our love, our love from God, his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, his peace, it pours out from us into the lives of the people around us. And when there are more of us gathered together, that becomes more profound. It makes a greater impact. But there's still more. This isn't it. But I have to admit on this last part, I'm going a little bit low budget. You see, in John 7, Jesus says, everyone who believes in him, when the Holy Spirit is poured out into their lives, it's like waters living streams, a fountain comes out of them and flows into others. So Jesus talks about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit from God, the Heavenly Father, but there's something special that happens when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for ourselves. It's like there's a fountain flowing up in us and it spills out into other people. And so in a high-tech world, imagine that these aren't just cups stacked up Rather, this is one of those fountains, those fountains that flows. That's what's happening in us because of the Holy Spirit. And when it flows into us, it flows out of us. The gifts of God flow out of us into all of the people around us. That's what was happening at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was poured out into those apostles and it poured out of them. It flowed out of them into the people all around. And when that happened, the Holy Spirit created this fountain, this fountain of life in all of those people that heard and believed the message. Their relationship with God was turned around. They were made right. And they would leave Jerusalem as changed people, people that now had something to pour out into the lives of others. What did they have to pour out? They had the gift of life, the gift of Holy Spirit. That's what God does with us. He changes us. He changes us and makes us have this right relationship with him so that we are like him. God gives of himself. He pours himself out into us. He wants us to be like that with others. But what do we have to pour out? What do we have to give? Only what God has first given us, the gifts of his spirit. And so we do that. 
We leave this place filled and overflowing to pour out Jesus' love his forgiveness, a word of mercy, a word of peace, a word of love. But we don't pour ourselves empty. We know that we always go back to our baptism and we can be filled again. We come on Sunday morning and we can be filled again. Why? So that we go out once more. Psalm 23, David talked about how God fills his cup to overflowing He does that with you and me as well. But let's not forget the why. What's behind all of it? It's so that we would be like him. God pours into us for a purpose. He fills us so that we would be overflowing with his love, with the good news of Jesus, so that they too would be made like us, so that they too would be made like Jesus. Jesus poured himself out for all of us. May we do the same for the whole world. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, fill, be poured out and fill your hearts and minds with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.